be talking about the anterior posterior patterning, the amorphogens, and the formation of the hunchback gradient in Drosophila. A little bit about Drosophila, Drosophila has been a model organism for over a decade now. That being said, it's only been in these last 50 to 60 years where through advances of molecular techniques, scientists have figured out these maternally lethal genes and how expression of these genes across the anterior posterior axis is responsible for proper anterior posterior specification and overall proper embryo development. The maternal lethal genes that I'll be talking about today are bicoid, caudal, nanos, torso, trunk, as well as hunchback. I'll start with bicoid. So bicoid is a maternally lethal expressed gene where the mother expresses and deposits these bicoid mRNAs to the anterior end of the embryo prior to fertilization. This results in bicoid being known as an anterior determinant, an anterior morphogen. You can see how if you have a mutant or no bicoid expression at the anterior end, you end up with an embryo that has what you call two telsons, or you can think of it also as phenotypic two buds. There are also posterior determined morphogens, such as this one in green nanos. In nanos, instead of having the mother deposit these mRNAs in the anterior end, like in bicoid, in the nanos, you have the mother depositing nanos mRNA at the posterior end, where if you have mutations in nanos or if nanos is completely eliminated, you end up with embryos that are lacking a lot of these posterior structures such as the abdomen and other components of it. Then there's also hunchback. Hunchback is, is where the interesting stuff happens. Hunchback normally is expressed evenly throughout the embryo. However, when you look at it, hunchback is only expressed at the anterior end. So why is it that maternal hunchback mRNA is deposited evenly throughout the embryo, however you only see it there? Well, the reason for that is what I drew, drew right here. You have this hunchback mRNA and its coding region right here. Well, towards the three prime end of this mRNA, you have a nanos response element. This nano response element is where when nanos is translated into this protein, nanos binds right here, and upon binding, it degrades the polyadenylated tail of hunchback mRNA. When you degrade this tail, you're preventing translation from occurring, and you're also unable to keep this mRNA structure completely stable. Ultimately, this results in hunchback mRNA degradation and which is why, because you see a lot of nanos expression on the posterior end, you cannot have much hunchback expressed there. However, at the anterior end, where less nanos is expressed, you have activation of hunchback via maternal bicoid, and from there, you have this anterior to posterior gradient of hunchback protein. In this sense, you can think of nanos as a repressor of hunchback. You can imagine that if you had nanos that became mutated or nanos just wasn't there, it was never deposited by the mother, then instead of seeing hunchback in a gradient where it's most prominent at the anterior end, you would see uniform distribution of hunchback mRNA ultimately leading to hunchback protein in the embryo. Something that's really peculiar that happens, you don't necessarily need this maternal hunchback if you eliminate nanos and you do not have this hunchback protein, uh, the embryo ends up developing fine. There is another maternally expressed gene known as caudal in this case, that's drawn here. Just like hunchback, caudal is also distributed by the mother evenly throughout the whole embryo prior to fertilization. However, again, when you, pheno when you look at its phenotype, you see that caudal expression is only seen at the posterior end in a gradient. So why is that the case? Well, in this case, just like how hunchback was repressed by nanos, bicoid in a sense is repressing caudal expression at the anterior end. As I've drawn here, you have this caudal coding region of the mRNA. You have this bicoid response element drawn in green right here. 
And what happens is when bicoid is translated into bicoid protein, it binds to its response element at the three prime end of this caudal mRNA. And with this binding, this bicoid response element combination is able to repress caudal mRNA translation. Well, how that happens is initiation factors, elongation factors necessary for translating an mRNA strand are inhibited because of bicoid. Because of that, caudal mRNA is not necessarily degraded immediately, but it is preventing caudal mRNA from being translated. And as an end result, you do not see caudal at the anterior end of an embryo. You see it only at the posterior end where bicoid is not really expressed because bicoid is in a gradient of its own at the, and most prominent at the anterior end. So then the last two maternal lethal genes that I'm going to talk about are torso and trunk. Torso are these receptors that are expressed throughout the embryo all across the anterior to posterior axis at the plasma membrane. Trunk is a ligand that is only expressed at the poles. So in order for trunk and torso receptors to interact with one another, they can only do so at these poles, at these anterior and posterior most ends. So when trunk ligand is bound to a torso receptor, this goes and ends up making these two proteins known as talus and huckabine. At the anterior end where you have bicoid expression, talus, huckabine, and bicoid combined are going to go and make the acron. The acron is the anterior most structures of the embryo, such as the head. And then at the posterior end where you don't have bicoid expression, because bicoid is expressing a gradient of its own, then talus and huckabine alone will go and make telson. Now you can see how this mechanism ties back to how when these scientists eliminate bicoid from these embryos, they saw that the embryo died and also made two telsons. This is because bicoid is expressed only at the anterior end. So in order to make acron, talus and huckabine need bicoid at the anterior end, which is what you see in normal embryos. But if bicoid since bicoid is at the posterior end, it's not really expressed, it goes and makes telson. So if you eliminate bicoid, bicoid is no longer there at the anterior end. So from there, this does not make acron, the anterior end will also make a telson, so you have two telsons. A common misconception with maternal lethal genes is an example just like this one. So say I'm focusing on the bicoid. If I have a female that has at least one wild type bicoid gene, and I cross that with another male that has a wild type bicoid gene, I end up in theory with progeny one fourth of the time that have not a single wild type copy of the bicoid gene. Some people say this progeny is dead. However, because this is the maternal lethal effect, it doesn't matter the genotype of the progeny. It doesn't matter that the progeny cannot make a single bicoid mRNA. It all that matters is that the mother has this one wild type copy of bicoid. Because of that, the mother can transcribe bicoid into mRNA, which then can be deposited into this progeny in order for normal Drosophila development in this embryo. To further extend on that though, if you took this embryo and you assume that it was a female and you cross it with a male that has two wild type copies of the bicoid gene, you end up with all progeny that have one wild type bicoid gene. Some people say this embryo, all these progeny are going to be alive because they have this wild type bicoid gene. Again, that's a misconception. This is a maternal lethal effect, which means it doesn't matter what the genotype of this, these progeny are. All that matters is that this mother does not have a single wild type copy of the bicoid gene. It cannot make proper bicoid mRNA to deposit into these progeny. So these progeny die. They end up potentially with two telsins and that's improper development.